Thank you, Pastor Brad. I appreciate the opportunity to share with New Hope Church again. I think it's been four years, so I'm a couple of days older uh, this time, but still kicking and uh, and loving being with you all. Uh, th this morning, um, in the next hour, we're going to be focusing on more recent events in the Middle East, what's brought us to this current conflict and where it's going in the future. Uh, I hope that you're able to, to hang around and to share that time with us because in this session, we're going to do ancient and in the next session, we're going to do modern and the two actually do go very, very well together. So looking forward to sharing that with you in the next um, in the next uh, time period. Um, it is it is Advent. In fact, this is the first Sunday of Advent. Advent's just a fancy name for ramping up to and preparing your heart for uh, receiving the presence of God in a new and and deeper way in the coming of Jesus. And so, before we jump into this, what does the Bible have to say about the land? Uh, whose land is it anyway? We could subtitle this. I thought it would be really good to jump into an Advent kind of context because it really does lead us right into our subject for this morning. If you are doing your Advent reading and you're doing these devotionals and you're coming to uh, prayer time for these days, uh, you're going to eventually get at some point to this story, the story of the birth of Jesus. And I hope this time, this year, and because of what's going on in our world and especially in the land of Israel, that some of the geographical components of this story are going to jump out at you. For example, in Luke chapter 2, we have Joseph and went up from Galilee from the city of Nazareth to Judea. The term comes from the tribe Judah, and it's actually the word the, the word Jew or Jewish or Jews or Judaism comes from this word Judah Judea. So Nazareth to Judea to the city of David which is called Bethlehem. Look, this story that we're approaching at this time of year is not a legend. It's not a myth. It's grounded and rooted in historical and in geographical realities. These are not mythical, make-believe places. These are real, true places that existed in the day and that still exist today and that we have the opportunity to take groups and study these text of our Bible that our faith is based on and do that in context on site. And it's real. Brad, you've been there. It's those uh, some of you other guys. We almost went and then this dirty little thing called COVID happened. We almost had a trip from Marysville, Kansas. Yeah. So they're tra we're traveling. They're traveling. Joseph is traveling to Bethlehem because he was of, of the house and, 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 and lineage of David, to register along with Mary, who was engaged, actually betrothed, uh, betrothed to him and was with child. Here we have Nazareth, and then we're going to look at Bethlehem. This cone-shaped building right here with the really squatty but big building underneath it, this is the Church of the Annunciation. It marks the location where the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and said, you're going to be, you've been chosen, you'll be the vessel through which the, the, the presence of God, the person of God, comes into this world. Since we can't get to him, he's coming to us. If you look back behind, this is huge Nazareth today. Back in Jesus' day, it was only about four or 500 people who lived in this, in this village. Now it's 220,000. Behind, though, you can see this agricultural area called the Beit Natofa Valley. And right here on the very edge of the picture, you can see Cana of Galilee, where Jesus worked his first miracle. Only nine miles from, from Nazareth. Um, a, a pretty quick, brisk walk in the morning, and you can be there by lunch. But this is where Jesus turned the water into wine at Cana or Cana of Galilee. Here's another picture, and this cross-shaped church is the church of the nativity in Bethlehem. 
It was built over top of a series of caves um, where, according to oral tradition and according to the earliest writings going back to the early 2nd century AD, we have record that Jesus was born in a cave underneath a home right here in Bethlehem, and this is the Church of the Nativity. On uh, Christmas Eve, you see live feeds from Bethlehem on your television screen, right? And you're seeing crowds gather in this big parking lot right here and in this entryway into the Church of the Nativity. This whole thing complex together is called, the, the, called Manger Square. You've heard this before, right? You've seen it live feeds on your television. Live from Manger Square. Well, you're looking at it right here. And when you're moving from Nazareth to Jerusalem, you're talking about 55 miles or so um, as the crow flies. Lots of twists and turns, but about 55 miles and then only another five more miles south from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. And here you are still in the hill country of Judah or Judea. Well, to continue the story, when we flip to Matthew's gospel, we get the same thing. That orientation of Bethlehem, Nazareth, Judea. Uh, and in Matthew's gospel, it's arise and take the child and his mother, says the angel to, uh, to Joseph when they're hiding in Egypt from wicked King Herod that wants to kill Jesus. And take his, the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. There it is again. Another geographical connection, another real place, not the land of make-believe. Some of you guys have seen Caillou where they have the little, you know, kind of bubbly, sort of cloudy stuff around the edges. And it, he's, he's dreaming. It's, he's, he's having sort of a daydream and it's not real. He's a little kid and he's driving a bulldozer or a bus down the road. We know these things don't happen. At least we hope they don't happen in your life. And so... But this is real. This is dialed into physical, observable reality and places that you can actually go. Another thing that you want to notice, though, is the angel, the gospel writer later, is going to use the covenant biblical names of these places, not the Roman overlays. We'll get to that in just a second. Take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. Those who sought the child's life, Herod the Great, is now dead. And he arose and took the child and his mother. And this is Matthew talking, the gospel writer, divinely inspired of the Spirit to write this and says, and he came to the land of Israel. Again, using the biblical and the covenant name, not the Roman overlay, the new and improved 2.0 version of whatever you're, however you're supposed to refer to this area. But when he heard, and more specific, that Archelaus, the oldest surviving son of King Herod, the Herod the Great, was reigning over Judea or Judah in the place of his father Herod, etc. And all of this is historical and geographical connectivity going on. When we get to the early life of Jesus, now he's been born. He's 40 days old, according to Leviticus chapter 12. It says, 40 days you appear before the Lord and you do the ceremony. Um, and and they've, Jesus, Joseph, and Mary have gone from Bethlehem five miles north to Jerusalem, and they're there at the temple. And this prophet Simeon comes in, and he blesses them and says to Mary, his father, uh, Mary, his mother, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel. And again in the Bible, in the New Testament, by prophet inspired by God, He's using that biblical, that covenant name of this area of the world, not the Roman overlay, uh, not the 2.0 uh, updated new and improved version. Men, uh, rise and fall of many in Israel. So Roman names back in Jesus' day, and we stole a scene from The Chosen. Some of you have watched that, and that's kind of cool way to, to, to ramp up to uh, the, the Advent, during Advent season, is to watch some of these about the birth of Jesus. And um, you see the guys in the red. Those are the bad guys, right? These are the Roman oppressors. They have been in Israel since 63 B.C. So by the time Jesus begins his ministry, Rome has oppressed, has occupied Israel for a whole century by this time. And they're not going anywhere. They'll be there for another six centuries. But these guys are renaming places, and they name it by Roman names. And so instead of the land of Israel or the land of Judah, they're referring to it as Provincia Judea. 
It's an occupied, annexed province has been incorporated into the Roman Empire. Sometimes they'll refer to it as Syria. We have Syria today. You've heard of the country of Syria. Damascus is its capital. Syria, Palestina. Hmm, that's an interesting word. Syria, Palestina, or sometimes more abbreviated, just Palestina. It's derived from a word that shows up in the Old Testament all over the place, the Philistines, the arch enemies of Israel back in the day. From Joshua's time all the way up through David and Solomon's time, uh, these guys are the arch enemies of Israel. And so what better way to demean and to marginalize a people than to rename their uh, covenant, their promised land a, a, by a, a Roman name referring to its place in the Roman Empire and to refer to it by the name of their arch enemies. Would that be pretty cool? I mean, how, how about it if in the United States one day we woke up and realized that we're being referred to as the USSR? Hmm? That's about how well it would go over. Now, just as a reminder, just keep these things in mind as we dive into the deep end of the pool on biblical material that Jesus was fully Jewish, 100% Jewish. Saw this video of a guy on uh, uh, oneforisrael.com, and he said Jesus was born of Jewish parents and was Jewish. He lived the Jewish life and he died a Jewish death. He was buried as a Jew. He rose as a Jew. He ascended as a Jew, and he's coming back as a Jew. This might sound almost disconnected from our world. Here we are in the Midwest, and there's not a big Jewish community close by that we're you know, aware of, keeps us aware of the, what kind of calendar Jewish festivals and what have you are going on, things that are happening within the Jewish community. I mean, this is not Chicago. It's not L.A. It's not New York, right? This is Marysville, Kansas, um, and wherever you happen to be watching from, guys online. Uh, but Jesus is, comes into our world at Advent, this time of year that we're celebrating the birth, fully Jewish. He chooses 12 disciples, close followers of his, and they're all Jewish. And then there's a 70, a group of 70 sent out in Luke chapter 10, and they're all Jewish. And then the 120 on whom the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, well, they're all Jewish as well. The Bible is written entirely, except for Luke and Acts, by Jewish authors. The, uh, the 3,000 that are saved on the day of Pentecost, they're, they're all Jewish. Later, the, the Bible speaks of the church growing to 5,000, and they're still, they're all in Jerusalem, they're all in Judea, they're all in the land of Israel, and they're all Jewish. Jesus is constantly looking backward for his sources of authority, and he's quoting the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. And again, all those authors are Jewish. The points that he makes, the way he interprets the Bible, it's all thoroughly Jewish. And finally, we get by Paul, who's the apostle to the Gentiles. He wants to remind everybody, put everybody on notice at the beginning of his greatest work, the book of Romans, um, that uh, in chapter 1, verse 16, he says, I'm not ashamed of this gospel, th this good news that I'm, that, that I'm proclaiming to as many people as I can. This gospel is to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Isn't that an interesting orientation that we've got? So let's take a look at our subject in detail. The Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, what does the Bible say about the ownership of the promised land, the land of Israel. We could take a lot of different approaches to this. We could look at it from a historical perspective. We could look at it from a legal perspective. We could look at it from the perspective of international law and what has the UN done and that kind of thing. We can also bring it closer to home and we could say, okay, well, what do I think about it? How do I feel about it? What's my personal opinion? Or we could go from the direction of, well, what do our leaders say? Or what does our news media say? There are a bunch of different ways that you could approach this, but that's not who we are. 
This is not a what's hot and what's not. This is not a, well, you know, it's popular in our culture to say or to think or to believe. That's not our source of authority. Our leaders certainly aren't our sources of authority on what we're supposed to believe and, and what we're supposed to do, how we live our lives as followers of Jesus. In fact, we call ourselves Protestants. More, more, more strictly, more specifically, we call ourselves evangelicals. We're followers of Jesus. We're believers in the Bible. And so every evangelical statement of faith, the Lausanne statement, the Chicago statement, the Baptist faith and message, the Assemblies of God's statement of fundamental truths, all evangelical statements of faith begin with a preamble, an introduction. And in that introduction, without exception, every one of these evangelical statements says the Bible is our only rule for matters of faith and practice, which is the Bible is our only standard for what we believe and how we live out that faith in our everyday lives. So when we want to know about some article of, of faith, what do I believe? What do I believe about the land? Who are the proper owners of the land? We don't go running to the news media or to our leadership or to our own personal feelings or uh, opinions or that of our parents or whatever. We go to the Bible. Anything that, anytime it's a matter of what do I believe and how do I live this out, this faith out in everyday life, our source, our only source is the, can you fill in the blank? I still get to do this because I'm an adjunct professor, okay? It's so on my union card. So every, day, every now and then there's a pop quiz, right? So yeah, exactly. You got it right. 100% check plus A for the course. You, you got it. It's, it. Our source is the Bible. Our source is Scripture. So starting with the beginning in the book of Genesis, the Lord said to Father Abraham, you remember this guy, there was a song about him. Father Abraham had many sons and daughters, many sons and daughters at Father they're Abraham, you, right? I'm one of them, so are you, so let's just praise the Lord. Okay, so this is Abraham, and God is speaking and making covenant to Abraham, and he says, all the land that you see, look at the very bottom, all the land that you see, I give it to you and to your descendants. And what's the last word here? Ad olam in Hebrew, and this is a perfect translation. It means for eternity or an everlasting promise or simply forever, ad olam. It's yours, it's your, not just yours, your descendants after you forever. How long would that be? A long time, right? Genesis 17, we, we can't just go with one passage. We're not up here cherry picking. Um, this, is, this is not something like, well, let me just go find in the Bible whatever I need to support my position. Let's look at a bunch of Bible. If you want a longer version of this, go to First Assembly of God, Jefferson City, that website, and there's like a 50-minute exposition on tons more of Scripture. We're just going to hit the high points. Genesis 17. This is going to be a covenant between you and me and your descendants after you for their generations for an everlasting covenant. How long is everlasting? to be God to you and your descendants, and I'll give you and I'll give to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for, and take a look at this, an everlasting possession. It's not that ad olam, it's ahuzat olam, but it's very close, an everlasting possession. It's sort of like when you put your um, uh, investments or your, your stock holdings, your property, your business or whatever in trust and it's locked in and your descendants, they can't fritter it away. They can't sell it. They can't uh, exchange it, barter it for something else. It is locked in. And that's what this Ahuzat Olam is. It's an everlasting possession. It will always be there odd eternity until the end of the world your uh, your descendants your, the beneficiaries of your entrust um uh, agreement is uh, th that's locked in forever 
Genesis 35. Now, the person that God's speaking to has changed. The promise stays the same. First, there's Abraham. Then there's his son, Isaac. And then Isaac's son of the promise is Jacob, exactly. So God said to him, your name is Jacob. No longer will you be called Jacob, but Israel will be your name. Thus he called him Israel. The land that he, the land that I gave to, watch this, Abraham and Isaac, now this is the third generation. I'm giving it to you. Covenant renewal with each generation. And I will give the land to your descendants after you. He's talking about not the first, second, third. He's talking about the fourth, the fifth, the eighth, the hundred and eighth, all the way down through the, 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 the line of his descendants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's descendants. This covenant is renewed, and it, a primary component of this covenant renewal, every time it's renewed, is the land, the land, the land. The, are you seeing it? I'm putting it in yellow. I'm underlining it. I'm bolding it. If I could, I'd do the jumping jacks. I would do the land is a part of the covenant promise and covenant renewal. Here's another generation that comes along. God is, is, has spoken to Jacob, and now Jacob is passing this on, like that in trust, like, like that covenant. He's passing that on to one of his 12 sons who become the leaders of the 12 tribes, right? One of those sons is Joseph. And so Jacob is speaking to Joseph in this passage, Genesis 48. I'm going to make you fruitful and numerous and a company of peoples. And then here again is the land promise. I will give this land, not just any old land. I'll give this land to your descendants after you for, and there's that phrase again, Ahuzat Olam. It's an entrust thing. It's set in stone. It can't be passed on to somebody else. It can't be uh, bartered away. It can't be sold. It can't be you know, frittered away by you know inappropriate handling. It's an ahuzat olam. It's an everlasting possession. Then we have, and it's not just in Genesis and Deuteronomy and the Torah, but it's also in other books in the Bible. Here's one, for example, from the historical books, Joshua 14. Moses spoke on that, swore on that day, saying, the land on which your feet have trodden will be an inheritance to you and to your children. And there it is, Ad Olam, forever, for eternity, for everlasting to everlasting, because you followed the Lord fully. So now we're going to move on to some prophetic stuff. Joshua is one of the prophets that I've chosen just as an example. It's in other places. It's in Isaiah. It's in Obadiah. It's in Zechariah. But we're going to look at Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Why is that? Because a lot of folks, even in Christian circles, in, even in Protestant circles, even in evangelical circles, even in Assemblies of God circles, will say, well, you know, Israel, ancient Israel had their chance. But then, because of their disobedience, because of rebellion, because they turned their back on the Lord, well, God allowed for the Babylonians to come in, 586, 587 B.C., and to destroy the temple, destroy Jerusalem, send the people into captivity, and with that, God was done with them. So, I've chosen the two primary prophets of the, the destruction and exile period. Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and we're going to look and see what these two guys have to say. Because what you're going to see, I'll tell you before we get there, is that you're going to see, yes, these are prophets of destruction and exile, but they are also prophets of restoration and return. They say, yes, it's coming, but God's going to restore. Why? Because he's faithful and because his covenant is Ad Olam. His covenant is Ahuzat Olam. It's forever. It's, it is his word. He's given his word. He's not going to step back on it. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to be thankful that we serve that kind of God. That even when we mess up, he doesn't give up on us. That, and, and that when we're in the time of our darkest hour, our deepest need, when, when our grandchild or child is in the emergency room, when our spouse that we love is, is on life support, that there's a God who still hears and he doesn't change. He promises and he fulfills. 
He gives his word and he doesn't back up on it just because it's convenient or because maybe, well, sorry, guys, you guys were born really late in time. And uh, I, I ran out of all of that really good stuff, all the promises and all the miracles and all the really cool stuff that I do in the lives of people that follow me. I just sort of used all of that up. I, I'm sorry, that's out of stock. Hope you don't hear that at Christmas. I'm sorry, that's on, on back order, y'all. You're going to have to wait till Jesus comes back. That's not the kind of God that we serve. And it's not the kind of God we're going to see in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. The days are coming when I'm going to restore the fortunes of my people, Israel and Judah. He saw the destruction coming. He predicted it accurately. Jeremiah even two times tells us that there's going to be an exile and it's going to last for 70 years. And yet he looked all the way through that and he's also seeing res restoration and return. I'll restore the fortunes of my people, Israel and Judah. You see how specific that is? Ethnically specific, geographically specific. I will also bring them back to the land that I gave to their forefathers and they will possess it. Did that happen? Yes. Remember the end of 2 Chronicles? Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, all of these books in the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament are recording the fulfillment of this very promise. It did happen. God reconstituted his people, restored them to the land, and restored his glory and his covenants and his promise and his presence with all of that as well. Jeremiah 31. I'm going to fast forward to this chapter because this is all over the place in the New Testament. It's, it's on the lips of Jesus. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, he says at the Last Supper. Remember this? In the book of Hebrews, this is quoted multiple times, this Jeremiah 31. Why is it such a big deal? Because it's talking about the new covenant, the new covenant that God is, or renewed covenant that God is going to make with his people. And watch how specific he, it is in certain aspects that for whatever we, reason we skip over those. Because we've got to get down to that new covenant. It's got to apply directly to us. Um, one of my favorite billboards that I've ever seen riding down the road says, the Bible is not about you. That's almost like a shock. No, but the Bible's about God. We just are bit players in this thing. The, the point of the matter is that, that God is, he is this good and this true to his word. He's the one who promises. The spotlight is on him. Okay, God, you've, you've kind of hung your shingle out now. It's your responsibility. And guess what? He comes through every time. What an incredibly awesome, consistent, trustworthy, worthy of our trust, trustworthy, covenant-keeping God we have. Yeah. So, Jeremiah, I will build you and you will be built, O virgin of Israel. A lot of people just take this and, okay, well, wherever it says Israel or, or Judah or people of God, we apply that automatically to us. God fulfills his promise here in all those books that I just cited a minute ago in the Bible about these people. O virgin of Israel, you'll plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. Is the church doing that? No, this is not about us. This is about them and it's about him. It's about his promise being fulfilled. There will be watchmen on the hills of Ephraim. I, I would not hesitate to say that probably 99% of the church couldn't tell you, couldn't pick it out on a map. This is the tribal allotment of Ephraim. This is not directly applied to us. This is about God fulfilling a promise at a specific point in time in 538 B.C. The hills of Ephraim, the watchmen will call out, let's go up to Zion and worship God. Verse 7, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, the remnant of Israel. I'm going to gather them from the remotest parts of the earth and they will return here. This is a part of one of the most important passages in the entire Hebrew Bible slash Old Testament. The new covenant, the promise of the new covenant in Jeremiah 31. He continues. For I'm a father to Israel. Ephraim is my firstborn. They will come and shout on the height of Zion. They will return from the land of the enemy, for there is hope 
for your future, declares Yahweh, and your children will return to their own territory. Is that specific enough? Return, O virgin of Israel, to these your cities. Let's take a look at Ezekiel. He's a contemporary of Jeremiah. He's also predicting destruction of the people and exile. He's also predicting return and restoration. He says, then you'll know that I am Yahweh. You'll know when I act. When I act, I glorify my name. When I act, I sanctify my name. And I cause everybody to know all about it. This is how big, this is how powerful, this is how awesome, this is how consistent and trustworthy I am. You will know this is me when this happens. Because this just doesn't typically happen in human history. A people are destroyed, their land is destroyed, they're sent into exile, and then you're going to say, yeah, you're bringing them back. They're going to be restored. They're going to be placed again in the land that was promised. And that happened, historically happened. We even have archaeology that demonstrates beyond the shadow of a doubt, proves that that happened. When I bring you into the land of Israel, that's when you'll know that I am the true God. When I bring you into the land of Israel, the land that I swore to give to your forefathers. Do you see how often that they're footnoting that this goes back to Father Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and the other uh, brothers and the 12 tribes and on and on and on. This is uh, that Ad Olam. This is that Ahuzat Olam part of this eternal, forever kind of covenant passed down from generation to generation. They're always looking back. You know how far that was back in human history? From our point, from our vantage point, 4,000 years ago to Father Abraham. I'd say that that's saying something about God's consistency, his faithfulness, his trustworthiness, his being true to his word. And guys, I'm, I know the Bible's not about us, but that applies directly to us. That's saying God's got a 4,000 year plus record, resume, portfolio that says he can be trusted. You got a problem, you got a need, you got a situation on your hands and it's bigger than you and you don't know where to go and you're not 100% sure what kind of decision to make. Thank God that we serve a God who's been on the job for over 4,000 years and he's never let one word of his promise fall to the ground. That's the kind of God that we serve. And I love that. Ezekiel says, when, you, when I gather the house of Israel, I'm going to, from wherever they were scattered, they will come and they will live in their land that I gave to my servant Jacob. Is that just specific enough? Now we come to this Ezekiel 37 chapter. And if you're watching YouTube and you're listening on Christian TV and stuff, everybody, because of what's going on in the Middle East, is talking about the battle between Gog and Magog, Armageddon, the end of the world. And so Ezekiel 37, it's appropriate that we look at it. When I did the last time, I realized, wow, yes, there are exciting things in there. Dead bones coming together and joining and God breathing life into dead skeletons and people coming up out of their graves. And there's some really exciting stuff in there. And you can see it right here on the screen. Can these bones live? Yeah. And I'm going to cause breath to enter them and they're going to come back alive. This is a great resurrection passage, by the way. But take a, in the middle of all this, just like in Jeremiah 31, in the middle of that new covenant renewal, we get land promise. Watch what happens in Jeremiah 37 and 38. I'll bring you into the land of Israel. Not just going to bring bones back together. Not just going to breathe breath back into dead bodies. Not just going to bring people up out of their, their graves. But I'm going to put them back in. It's connected to land. It's always tracking back to land. It's always a part of covenant re renewal. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, etc. It's constantly land, land, land. I'll bring you into the land. And then in verse 14, I'm going to put my spirit in you and you're going to come to life and I'll pray, place you on your own land. Why is that? Everything is going back to Father Abraham where it all started. That original land promise, which was how long ago? 
4,000 years ago from our vantage point in history. Well, why don't we just move on and take a look at some New Testament stuff? Because it's there too. Would you be, would you be surprised if the God of the Old Testament was not the same God of the New Testament? Would you be surprised if, if he was the same? He was the same God, the same message. Let's hope not, because he is that consistent, old and new. He is the same. The grass withers and the flower fades, but God's word stays the same forever, right? Isaiah chapter 40. I am Yahweh. I do not change. Malachi chapter 3. Psalm 55. Even to your old age, I am the same. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus is the same. Yesterday, help me out with this. Today and forever. There's that Adolam thing. This is just not a bait and switch God. This is not a a, a, a um, fair weather God. Yeah, I'm there in good times, and after that, you're sort of on your own. That is not the God that we serve. This God runs to a fight. Th this God runs into burning buildings, just like those first responders on 9-11, but even in a greater degree. This is a God who, he's a very present help in time of trouble. That's the kind of God that we're dealing with. So we should expect that there be continuity, consistency in the message. And so here's what Jesus has to say. When they persecute you in one city, then flee to the next. When you're out there representing me, I'm sending you out. Bear the message. Proclaim the good news. And he says, truly, I say unto you that you won't finish going through the cities of Israel until I come and confirm the message that you have been proclaiming. I hope it jumps out at you at this point. Notice that he doesn't use Surya Palestina or Provincia Judea or just Palestina. He's not using those Roman overlays. He's going back to the language of the covenant and he's refer referencing the covenant that God made that is now 4,000 years old. It goes all the way back to the father Abraham who had many sons and daughters, many daughters and sons had father Abraham. You know, the guy about the, that the song was written about. So here's Jesus again. Different gospel, same, same message. Jesus says, I tell you in truth that there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah. Many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha. He's preaching this in Nazareth. He's preaching this from his perspective as far as he's concerned with his orientation and the language that he uses. He's describing his home and his homeland as the land of Israel. He's using that covenant language, that language that tracks back to Father Abraham 4,000 years in human history. He is not using the Roman 2.0 upgrade type language to refer to this piece of property. Those Roman names, you'll remember, were not Judea or land of Israel or these biblical cities like Nazareth and Bethlehem, but this is Provincia Judea. This is not Provincia Judea, not for Jesus, not for the prophets, not for Moses, not, not for anybody in the Bible, never Provincia Judea, Surya, Palestina, or Palestina. They're never going to refer to their homeland by the name of their arch enemies. Instead, it is land of Israel. Land of the forefathers, land of the promise, land of the covenant. You get this in uh, when, when you look at the, uh, the the early Christian leaders. Remember Stephen? He's the first Christian martyr. His story is in Acts six, Acts seven, and a little bit of Acts eight. This is New Testament stuff. And, and Stephen, under divine inspiration, and and written in Scripture, and divinely inspired because it gets included in Scripture. He says, God gave Abraham no inheritance in the land of Canaan, not even a foot. And, and yet, even when he didn't have a child, he promised that he would give it to him as a possession. Remember that, achuzat olam, an everlasting or eternal possession. So he's using the language of the covenant and to his offspring after him. In other words, to his descendants, ad olam, forever, until all eternity, everlasting. In Romans chapter 11, and I'm going to conclude with these things, Paul raises a question that's still being talked about in the church today. 
It's still being talked about in the news media today. Are they still a part of the promise? Is there any place for modern Israel in God's promise? Well, Paul raised that question 2,000 years ago. Book of Romans, front and center, New Testament, apostle of Jesus. And he says, God hasn't rejected his people, has he? No way. He uses the, the, the other holy language, Spanish. No way, Jose. And then he presents himself as exhibit number one. I'm an Israelite. I'm a descendant of Abraham. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. So, yeah, I'm Jewish. And God has selected me. He's using me. I'm not outside of God's plan. And then he says, this is his draw the line and add it all up and, and total uh, the conclusion. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. If he did, then he could also reject us. That would be my argument. How would that fit? Would that work well for you? I think not. God has not rejected his people whom he has foreknown. We also get this. These are, these are the Israelites. The Israelites to whom belongs the adoption of sons, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service, and the promises. Real quick, um, pop quiz again. Harken back to your English class in the sixth grade, and you're talking about verb tenses, and you're learning for the first time. Maybe it wasn't the sixth grade. I've been, it's been a long time, so teachers, forgive me. Maybe it was fourth grade. I, I don't remember. But you're talking about verb tenses, and you're talking about past, present, and future. You know about that, right? Which one is this? To whom belongs. So, Two and a half decades after Jesus was crucified, buried, resurrected, and ascended into heaven, Paul is writing the book of Romans, A.D. 54-ish. And he's saying, currently, in his day, on our side of the cross, these people who are Israelites, to them, currently, present tense, belongs the adoption as sons, the covenants, and the promises. Okay, so... I was raised by a dad who had been beaten out of his business by or who got cheated by or I didn't like these people in school or whatever. Are we going to make our decision about where we stand today on issues that are being discussed in your workplace, issues being discussed at your Thanksgiving table among family members? Issues being discuss discussed across the back fence with your neighbor or at the feed and seed whenever you go for supplies. Um, do you stand on the basis of what the Bible is saying or do you stand on the basis of some past bad, negative, whatever experience, personal opinion or what you hear on the news or whatever? I, that's a legitimate question, isn't it? Isn't that a fair question at this point in the game? Okay. Let's take a look at one more scripture from Paul. From the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. You see how even in the New Testament, they're footnoting all the way back to Father Abraham. Because, and this is directly relevant, not just to them, but also to us. The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable doesn't call them back, doesn't void them, doesn't negate them. They don't expire. The gifts and the call of God are ir Are you glad that God's faithful to you? God's faithful to these promises as well. So what do we do with this? Keep these three things in mind, if you don't mind. This is a largely a matter of the heart. We have to constantly guard ourselves as human beings against arrogance and pride. True or false? It's true. It's true in this, in this instance as well. Keep in mind that it is the root of the tree that supports you and not the other way around. The Bible encourages us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. 
It doesn't just encourage us. It's in the voice of command. And then whatever way that you can find, if, that's a, if there's a prayer vigil, if, there are, if you can put up posters, if you can um, uh, so, uh, make a telephone call and encourage a, a, a Jewish friend or neighbor or a coworker, find a way. Help, ask God to help you find a way to comfort and support Israel in, when they are in the midst of Jacob's trouble. And I've got passages for that. Paul says in Romans, New Testament, remember that it's not you who supports the root. It's the root that supports you. Psalm 122, pray. And I've given you the Hebrew there because the ooh on the end, that little yellow letter at the end, makes it plural, all of y'all. And it makes it imperative. It's the voice of command. There's an exclamation point there. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be in your walls and prosperity in your, in your palaces. We are called on as the people of God who have accepted the Bible as our only rule for faith and practice, what we do and, how we, and what we believe. We're challenged to pray. So could you make that? Could you make some of these grandmothers and children and teenagers who are held captive today by Hamas in the Gaza Strip could you make that a regular point of prayer? I'll tell you this. My grandchildren, the three that are still living at home, all picked kids their age to pray for, and all three of those kids are already home. God will answer prayer. Why? Because he's faithful. His word declares it. Comfort my people, the prophet says. And look at that ooh there again on the end. That means everybody, all of y'all, and you can use the southern plural, right? Okay, all of y'all comfort my people. It's plural, and it's the imperative. It's not optional. Comfort, find a way, be creative. Ask God to lead you. Ask God to open doors, to give you opportunity to do whatever you can do personally to comfort his people. And then finally in Psalm 82, and this one doesn't get a whole lot of press, but it says, rescue the weak and the needy and deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. Ladies and gentlemen, you're the people of God and led by the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit. Do these imperatives. They're not options. This isn't a multiple choice question. These are the voice of command. Would you stand with me and let's pray. Father, we want to give you praise that your word is so clear. It's clear on how we're saved. It's clear on what you, how you call us to live and morality and ethics and, and, and that kind of thing. We are also seeing coming to a point of clarity on this issue as well. Equip your, uh, your, your representatives, the body of Christ, to have meaningful conversations over coffee and at the water cooler, at the lunch table. Um, at Christmas celebrations. Encourage them, Lord, to be sources of, of more light rather than heat in their discussions. E enable us to think biblically and to dial in on the Bible and to make it our rule for matters of faith and practice. And God, help us, bestir us to be all of the help that we can be in the time in this time of Jacob's trouble. Lord God, motivate us to pray. Help us to check our attitude and not be arrogant and not be prideful. Lord God, help us to recognize that our source that, that, that feeds us is the root of the tree. Lord God, do something inside of us. Give us ideas, make us creative, mobilize us and give us boldness and courage, Lord God, to comfort your people and to rescue the needy and the weak out of the hands of the wicked. And Lord, we pray it in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Good morning, New Hope. It's good to be back with you. I think it's been four years. Hopefully you've recovered by now. Um, if, if not, we'll just kind of add on to the, we'll, we'll increase the misery. The beatings will continue until the morale improves. Okay, so as Pastor uh, Brad says, and thank you so much for the opportunity to share with your folks. Um, as, as he mentioned, we had in first service a focus on um, ancient Israel and the Bible 
uh, th in this particular um, uh, time, we're going to spend some time looking at more recent developments, um, what we would call more modern history. And, and the goal in both of these sessions, first service, second service, has been to, um, to, to build into you, to equip you to make decisions about why, where do I stand in the current situation and why do I stand there to have a legitimate, reasoned, evidence-based position rather than I think, I feel, I hope they said on TV, um, uh, somebody that I admire very much, my parents or whatever, that's what they think. That So that's where I'm standing. I want you to have an evidence-based um, position. And I want you to be able also, when questions come up at, at work or even in church or uh, in your book club, wherever you happen to be out in the community, that you're able to bring more light to the conversation than just heat. And so we're doing this kind of two-pronged approach, ancient stuff and now more modern stuff. And I hope that it is going to be a benefit to you personally and that it will be something that you can share when you're in conversation with friends, uh, family, coworkers, et cetera. Um, we're going to look more at big picture. I, I think that one of the problems that we have in our world is we take the keyhole approach. Is, is we're trying to look at our world through through the keyhole, and uh, how many of you know you've maybe tried to you know, take a peek into the into the room? Maybe you were a kid and you were playing spy game and uh, you're spying on your parents or some friends that were over or whatever, and you get a very limited perspective. What I would like for you to be able to do once this session is over is to come to this current conflict with a broader perspective, broader in terms of history, broader in terms of geography. And so the first thing that I'd like to do is to put this conflict between Israel and the terror group Hamas into geographical context. This is a, uh, a map of most of Africa, Europe, and uh, the Middle East, all the way to China. The little red spot right in the middle this is the 8,500 square miles that constitute modern Israel. Very interesting, huh? It's surrounded by 25 Arabic-speaking countries and 49 predominantly Muslim countries. To put it in another perspective, and I tried to focus this right on top of Marysville, Kansas, all right? You can fit, almost fit, 10 Israels into the state of Kansas. Here's a close-up of the land of Israel, not super detailed map, but what I'm hoping is that you are able to take a mental picture of what you're seeing on the screen now and understand what we're talking about when we talk about this little chunk of green and yellow striped land that is called today the Gaza Strip. It's a 10, approximately 10 mile wide by 50 miles long strip along Israel's southern coastline of the Mediterranean Sea. So far, so good. Okay, Israel proper is all yellow. This little narrow strip of green is what is called the Golan Heights, and it's directly adjacent to the Sea of Galilee. Right. Don't be afraid. You can jump right in. The water's fine. Okay. This big chunk of green right here is what most moderns and most Westerners refer to as the West Bank. Why is that? Because this is the Jordan River that connects the Sea of Galilee with the Dead Sea. So it's west of the Jordan River. It's the West Bank area of the Jordan. You'll never hear an Israeli refer to this. Bibi Netanyahu, when he's speaking on television, on radio, he will always refer to this as Judea and Samaria. Those are the biblical names. The way that this came to be known as West Bank is that in the 67 war, the kingdom of Jordan was one of five nations surrounding Israel. You have to add to this Iraq, which is in this direction, um, attacked Israel. And in 1967, I'm sorry, 1948, 
uh, in the War of Independence, and Jordan conquered, retained, occupied, and then eventually in 1950, illegally annexed this area, contrary to international law, um, League of Nations, United Nations, UN, sometimes stands for unnecessary, um, but um, th 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 this area came to be a part of, annexed part of the Kingdom of Jordan. In 1988, the, the Kingdom of Jordan relinquished, renounced all claims to any one square inch of what we call today the West Bank, what Israelis refer to as Judea and Samaria. Anyway, that's just kind of a primer of what we're going to do. Now, for those of you who are in, still in school, you do this on a regular basis, so don't zone out because this is not on TikTok. You're not going to get what I'm going to give you on TikTok. Um, we were in Israel um, during, during the current war. We actually flew into the war that was three hours and 2,500 rockets old um, at the beginning of the war on October the 7th. Um, and we were there until the middle of October and were able to uh, evacuate ourselves. So in uh, 1920, we're dialing back 100 years now, right? A century ago, what was happening was the end of what we call World War I. And in World War I, there were two primary allies. There was Germany in the West, and there was what it was called the Ottoman Empire, um, an empire that was basically created by Turks. You know, the, 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 the country, the nation called Turkey today. All right. So uh, Israel, what we call Israel today, was just a little tiny chunk of the Ottoman Empire. It was not called Palestine. There is no Palestine a hundred years ago. It was referred to as the Sanjak or the province of Jerusalem, the province of Nablus, and the province of Akka or Akko. Never, it, no one had any idea uh, of a uh, hundred years ago of anything called Palestine. There were no Palestinians. The term was not used, hadn't been used since Roman times, since back in New Testament times. And at this time, Arabs and Jews were already fighting one another, and it was not about statehood. How do we know this? Israel didn't become a state till 28 years later. Okay? So these things that we hear on the news, well, it's because of Israel and declaring statehood and, you know, they want their own country. No one has their own country. This is under the Ottoman Empire. It's being ruled from, um, uh, from the area that we call Turkey today. Istanbul is the capital. Arabs and Jews are already fighting one another prior to 1920, prior to the end of World War I and Britain and France being given this territory of the Middle East, divide, carved it up, divided it up. Britain takes parts of it. France takes parts of it. And they, they rule this country for approximately 28 years. Here's a picture of the Ottoman Empire. It is really important for you to take a mental picture of this slide as well. Not the green, but all this other color. This is all from in Spain in the west all the way to India in the east. This is the Ottoman Empire all the way up to Russia in the north and controlling almost half of Africa. This is the Ottoman Empire. It is under Turkish Muslim rule. Everybody okay on this so far? Feel like you're back in school? It is what it is. That's what I do. Okay, so World War I is over, and this part of the world gets carved up by the League of Nations that then morphs into the United Nations and given over to Britain and France, two of the major allies against Germany and Turkey. And since Germany and Turkey lost the war, then Turkey, the Ottoman Empire, collapses. So, largely speaking, this is Jordan River right here, right? It divides British um, mandate period, uh, and then French is up in Syria and, uh, and Lebanon along the coast. So France and England. 
um, the original goal, and the first the, uh, the, the first offer that was made to the inhabitants of the land when Britain can when England came in, was that on the west side of the Jordan River, they were going to make a state and they were going to make a homeland for refugees from the Holocaust and from persecuted communities in Eastern Europe, Western Europe of Jews to come back on the west side of the Jordan River. The east side of the Jordan River was going to be given to, uh, to, to Arabs. So that, that area that, that, that was controlled by Britain came to be known as Palestine. They reached back, if you were in the, the previous service, they reached back to Roman times and they used a Roman term and brought it up into the modern day and, and, and stamped on this area the name Palestine. It comes from the word Philistine, the arch enemies of the people of Israel in the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible. All of the citizens of this mandate period um, land were called Palestinians. Jews and Arabs were both called Palestinians. How do we know this? I have friends who have parents and grandparents who are old enough and still have their green citizenship card. And under religion, it says Jew. And under nationality, it says Palestinian, which is really interesting. Jewish Palestinians. Are you getting that on CNN or Fox News? No, you don't get that. But that is simply a reality. I have held those green cards in my hands, laminated, of course, at this point for protection. But um, all the citizens are called Palestinians, including Jews. The Jewish and Arab immigration uh, as World War II has ended in 1945 and all the way up to 1948 in those three years, Jews and Arabs are pouring into this land in record numbers. Arabs, on their part, are opposing any Jewish immigration. You've seen pictures of boats being turned away in internment camps of Jews, even after esca escaping uh, the horrors of, the world, of World War II. Europe are, are, are put in concentration camps inside the land of Israel. It isn't the land of Israel yet. It's British Mandate Palestine. You've seen those pictures probably on TV. Um, and the Arab, Arab versus Jewish violence intensifies. It continues and gets even greater during this time as we're approaching, moving in the direction of statehood, but under the British mandate. Here's a picture from the time period. Here's, these are some Jewish freedom fighters in a convoy. All right, so I talked to you about on the west side of the Jordan River, this area here was supposed to be in the original partition plan um, imposed by the uh, League of Nations and approved by or it, it originated in, in Britain, Jewish Palestine, and then Transjordan was supposed to be the homeland for Arabs living in this part of the world under the British mandate. That was the original plan. It was rejected by the Arabs, accepted by the Jews, rejected by, the, by Arabs. Why? What would the reason be? Because the Arabs said, we want all of the land, not some of it, not even most of it. They're getting 77% of British mandate, quote, Palestine or Transjordan when they get this big yellow chunk. Jews on this side were getting 23%. So 77 versus 23. Why was it rejected? They wanted, the Arabs wanted all of the land. Please place a bookmark in your mind there. This will be a recurring theme that we get as we look at other options that are offered. Here's offer number two, the second British plan. Um, and that was, and look at the map, in the, in the yellow, this was the area that was to be given to Jews. It's some part of the northern part of the coast and kind of sort of Galilee. The rest of the country was supposed to be given to Arabs with an international belt dividing the two in between that included Jerusalem, Bethlehem, and an outlet to the sea at Joppa or Jaffa. All right, so in this plan, Arabs were supposed to get 
not only the the 77 percent on the east side of the Jordan River, but they were also supposed to get 80 percent of the territory on the west side of the Jordan River. So far, so good. They hadn't lost anybody, but this was rejected by the by Arab leaders and by the Arab rank and file. For what reason? Because they insisted on controlling, had ruling over 100% of the land, 80-20 on the west side and 100% on the east side of the Jordan River was not sufficient. Third proposal, it's called the Woodhead Commission um, and uh, it comes up in 1938 and it looks a, a lot alike except Arabs gain two more percent of the area on the west side of the Jordan. Now it's an 1882 split. Remember, 100% they get of the 77% on the east side of the Jordan. Now we're all only talking about how the land will be divided on the west side. They get it all on the east, 77% of British mandate, and of the 23% that's left, they, they're gonna get 82% of that 23%. I'm not real good at math either. Don't don't let it bother you. You see the map though, right? Okay. Uh, this third proposal was rejected by the Arabs. For what reason? The reason they gave gave for rejecting this was we deserve, we want, we insist on controlling and ruling over 100% of the land. All of the 77 and all of the 23. Remember back at the original map? Okay. Uh, uh, proposal number four. This is called the Anglo-American Committee proposal. And it looks almost exactly the same, but this was the fourth kick at the cat, the first, um, uh, the fourth option that was placed on the table. This, and, and you'll note the, the year, 1945, Holocaust is over. We're finding out that there are six million Jews and um, and 60 million worldwide who are killed in uh, World War, the conflict that we call World War II. And so there are refugees all over the place. And this was rejected not only by the Arabs, but also by the Jews who said, we have to have more land than a narrow belt on the northern coast and kind of sort of Galilee, the, the area in the north. We need more land because there are more refugees. They're pouring in by the hundreds of thousands. And we've got to have more territory to settle these people who have been uh, persecuted, who are half dead, been uh, kicked out of their homes and uh, communities in Eastern, Western Europe, et cetera. And they, they have to have more territory for a homeland. So both are rejecting on this fourth option. Fifth time that uh, land is, is offered is called the Partition Plan. And you probably hear about this more than any of the others on the news, the UN Partition Plan. This dates back to 1947. It's just on the eve of independence of both Jordan and Israel, and another offer is made. And on in this offer, because of the recognition, we have a gigantic refugee problem. It is largely uh, due to the fallout of World War II and the Holocaust. And so we're going, we're going to give the 77% on the east side, that all still goes to the Arabs. None of that changes. But now we're talking about 56% and 43%. In other words, almost a half and half split with the international zone shrinking to just basically Jerusalem and Bethlehem. The Jews accepted this plan. The Arabs rejected that. And pl the escalation of fighting is really intense now because the, Britain, the, the British um, mandate is, 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 has been decreed to be over and England is uh, sending their soldiers and uh, all of their military weaponry and what have you back home to, uh, to England. It has almost bankrupted England. Here's a picture of a uh, front page of a newspaper. Um, notice the name of it. They've revived that old name that the Romans gave to this area. Syria, Palestina becomes Palestine um, with both Jews and Arabs uh, have, having Arab having Palestinian on their identification papers. Now we have the end of the British mandate period in 1948 and uh, the um, uh, the people of Israel declare independence. 
for the nation of Israel. They're declaring the existence of, and this is in conformity to a uh, vote that was held in the UN um, that basically establishes a, quote, Jewish homeland, 1948. And as soon as Israel declares independence, then Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Egypt, and the Arabs inside of the land of Israel um, invade. And the War of Independence takes place in 48-49. The map corresponds to the realities of the conclusion of of 19 at the end of 1949 when an armistice agreement it's not exactly a treaty it's kind of a, a treaty wannabe uh, an armistice is signed and Israel gets the area in yellow and light yellow or um, light orange um, the green is controlled by Jordan who had attacked from the east and it's called the West Bank Egypt has uh, conquered this area 50 by 10 uh, miles, 10 miles wide, 50 miles long, called the Gaza Strip. Okay, uh, the area up here in yellow that is called the Golan Heights is still controlled by Syria. So no change there. That's not, is it supposed to be a demilitarized zone, which means that it's militarized to the max, right? But not controlled by Israel, not in 1948 to 1949. In fact, not until 1967. All right. In 1964, the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, is formed. And this is not Ringo Starr, and these are not the Beatles. This is Yasser Arafat, who recently passed away. And the, for the rest of his life, he would be in, uh, he would be the leader of the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO. The goal of the PLO, the, the, its purpose for existing, was to destroy the modern state of Israel. This happened in 1964 and actually happened on the Mount of Olives, just down the street from the Chapel of the Ascension, where Jesus um, uh, went, uh, uh, ascended into heaven. Very ironic, right? Um, so the PLO eventually morphs into the PNA, which then evolves into today's PA, or Palestinian Authority. 1967, the Six-Day War takes place, and you have the maps of this is what Israel looked like before the Six-Day War, the 1967 war. Israel is in the light blue or the off green or whatever color that is. And once six, the Six-Day War is over, Israel has conquered the Sinai, kept all of Israel, conquered the West Bank, and conquered the Golan Heights, as well as the Gaza Strip. So this is Israel in 19, from 1967 all the way until the Yom Kippur War of 1973, when on the holiest day, the most solemn day of the Jewish calendar, Egypt and Syria, along with lots of other uh, bit part players, attack Israel um, uh, unprovoked on the day that they are um, mourning for and repenting for their sins. Uh, every once every uh, every year, the Day of Atonement, the the Yom Kippur War, and uh, so here's a picture from the time period: uh, an Israeli tank that. Um, uh, is going against the Egyptians in the Sinai. At any rate, no border changes resulted from that, even though Israel conquered land all the way up to Damascus in Syria. They were on the outskirts of Damascus, and they retreated, and they kept only what they had before uh, of the Golan Heights. Uh, and so the borders basically stayed the same. 1978, we have the what are called the Camp David Accords. Do you remember this? You recognize this guy, his wife just passed away, Jimmy Carter, right, president of the United States, along with the president of Egypt, Anwar Sadat, and the prime minister of Israel, Menachem Begin, and, or Menachem Begin, as we say. And these guys make a peace accord, and this is the first time that Israel, the modern state of Israel, is able to make peace with a, an Arab, predominantly Muslim neighbor, and that is Egypt in return for uh, the return of the Sinai Peninsula to um, the, uh, the um, modern state of Egypt. 
this was the, the, the Sinai Peninsula was never a part of biblical Israel. Biblical in Israel ends in the Negev at Beersheba. And the, the, you can feel free to look at your maps in the back of your Bible because they're free. You already bought them. They're there for a reason. 1987 through 1993, and we're getting closer to the current day, is what is called the first Arab uprising. You've heard the word on, on, the, on the news maybe, intifada. The, the first Arab intifada, people living inside the, the borders of Israel who are Arabs, uh, were in a state of revolt, riot, etc., for about five years, five, almost six years. And the claim was economic and social uh, oppression. And this led to what is called Oslo, Oslo One, the Oslo Accords, under Bill Clinton, um, who is now president of the United States. Who organized that uh, that those peace talks um, in 1988? I mentioned this before. Jordan relinquished all territorial claims to this area that we call we call in the West the West Bank that Israelis call Judea and Samaria. So all hands are off as far as the West Bank goes. No territorial claims on the part of this kingdom to the east of Israel, the modern-day kingdom of Jordan, ruled by King Abdullah II today. Back in those days, it was ruled by King Hussein, who has passed away. So far, so good. 1988. All right, in 1993, Oslo I uh, concludes with peace between Israel and Jordan, a second predominantly Arab, predominantly Muslim neighbor to the east, has now made peace, official peace, peace treaty, not armistice, not um, ceasefire agreement, a peace treaty. Uh, they are now like allies. They're sharing, um, the Israelis are sharing technology and that kind of thing, agricultural technology, uh, desalination technology with the modern day kingdom of Jordan. Part of this also, the Oslo one, is the letter, what is called the letter of mutual recognition, where for the first time, the Palestinian uh, um, Liberation Organization morphs into the Palestinian Authority. They are given Jericho, Bethlehem, and the Gaza Strip, and in return for the PLO or PA recognizing Israel's right to exist. And Israel recognizes the PLO, which is now the PNA and then PA, as the legitimate representatives of the Palestinian people living within the borders of modern Israel. The way that Hamas, who's a splinter group uh, today of the Muslim Brotherhood, and you've heard of the Muslim Brotherhood, if not, there's this glorious invention called the Internet. We, we can't do it all in one hour. But so, so what we've got is we've, we've got Hamas, a splinter group of the Muslim Brotherhood, who called this, this Oslo one, a, a, a peace treaty between infidels and infidels. Between these guys, this is Prime Minister of Israel, Yitzhak Rabin, and this is King Hussein of Jordan, um, and these guys are being called by Hamas infidels for making peace with one another. Interesting. Bill Clinton in the middle. Another, uh, the, now we've done five, five options, five proposals, all been rejected. Now we're going to look at the final and the sixth uh, proposal, and that is Oslo 2. Um, Oslo 2 is from 1995 to the year 2000. Oslo 2 is, again, encouraged by the United States. This is Ehud Barak, who's the prime minister of Israel at the time and Yasser Arafat in full military uniform. Notice civilian military, right? Israeli and Palestinian. Okay, in Oslo 2, 100% of the Gaza Strip was offered complete autonomy. 92% of the West Bank was offered. The offer was rejected by the Palestinian Authority. The talks then broke down. And Yasser Arafat, the guy in the military uniform, launches Intifada or Arab Uprising number two. And this takes place all the way through the year uh, 2000. Um, this is the sixth offer, and it was rejected as well. Why do you suppose 
if they were going to get 100% of the Gaza Strip and 92% of what we call today the West Bank, why would they reject this offer? Let's do a real quick review. The original mandate gave all 77% of the land east of the Jordan for Arab inhabitation and rule. Um, and then on the, on the Israel side, they were giving 80% approximately of that to Arabs and approximately 20% for Jewish um, immigration. In the second option, offer, the Peel Commission report, 80%. The Woodhead Commission report, 82%. Anglo-American, 80%. The UN Partition Plan, 43%, but that's specifically of the land to the west of the Jordan. The sixth option was, uh, uh, offer, was 100% of the Gaza Strip and 92% of what we call today the West Bank. Do you see a theme developing? What is the reason for rejection. Okay, they wanted all of the land, but why? This is not talked about on our news. You will not get this information off of Fox News or off of CNN. You're not going to get it from ABC, NBC, and CBS. So, focus. It, is, it goes back to a doctrine within a certain segment of Islam called Dar al-Islam. It's an Arabic phrase that means the house of Islam. And basically, you see the map, it is referring to as the, the furthest reaches that were ever under Islamic control. Well, that goes back to the Ottoman Empire, right? The empire that the Turks built that goes from Spain in the west all the way to India, almost to China in the east. It goes as far from, as, from the north as far as the reaches of, of, of Russia and all the way down halfway at half of the continent of Africa. That is Dar al-Islam. That is the house of Islam. And the doctrine, you know, we have doctrines like the, Jesus is divine and, and there's only one way to salvation and the Bible's divinely inspired and Jesus is coming back. We have doctrines within Christianity, right? There are doctrines within Judaism. There are also doctrines within Islam. And within Islam, within a certain segment of Islam, and this includes Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas, is that every inch of property that was ever controlled by Muslims has to remain under Islamic control. And if there is one inch of territory that lies outside of Muslim control, then it is the duty of every true observant Muslim to make sure that they engage fully in retaking that area. Here's an interesting development. This is a more modern development. But scholars and we would call them pastors, imams and mullahs of, uh, of Islam have extended Dar al-Islam to include anywhere in the world where there is a significant Muslim community or population that community should be under Islamic control. That's the reason why in certain places within London, you have, they are no-go zones, and they are under Sharia, Islamic law, Quranic law. And they have carved these enclaves out as we are an independent nation. We rule ourselves. How about Dearborn, Michigan, ladies and gentlemen, or Fairfax, Virginia? How about Los Angeles? How about New York City? Should Dar al-Islam extend to include now, because there are significant Muslim communities within the borders of the United States, should we be under Islamic rule? Well, you would say no, but someone from the Muslim Brotherhood someone who, who is um, a, a wasabi in Saudi Arabia or Hamas says, yes, and as an observant Muslim, I should do everything in my power to make that a reality. That's what we're dealing with when we're seeing six re historic historical rejections of offers of up to 92% of the West Bank, 100% of the Gaza Strip. 
Bethlehem gone, Jericho gone, and there is still rejection. It's, it's not because they're just mean people. It's not because they're just illogical. There is a doctrinal motivation. There's a belief system. There's a worldview that says it has to be under Islamic rule. So there you have it. This is what the world should look like, at least according to the doctrine, according to the worldview of Hamas, the Muslim Brotherhood, and this whole segment of um, the Islamic community. You can disagree with it, but they still believe it. And they don't just believe it, they want to put that into practice. And so with the launching of the Second Arab Intifada, um, after Oslo too broke down, um, then there were so many um, bus bombings and bus station bombings and restaurant bombings, suicide bombings and that kind of thing going on in the land of Israel that a security fence began to be built. And you've heard about the fence. You see what it looks like, at least in part here. Sometimes it's a wall, sometimes it's a fence, sometimes it's just a whole bunch of Constantine wire strung out on the ground. But there is a border, a boundary um, that is not supposed to, uh, to be crossed. Um, Israel has then been accused of apartheid. Question, why is it that there are 220,000 Arab Israelis living just in the one city of Nazareth? Why are there Arab Israelis at all? And there are hundreds of thousands of them if, if apartheid is the thing. No, it's not about apartheid. It's about security. Bibi Netanyahu said in an interview one time, he said, you can say what you want to say about the wall, but it worked. The bombing stopped. There's been considerable peace in Israel ever since, all the way up until the, until the Hamas war. Uh, speaking of which, um, is this an, an anomaly? Is this unique? Is this something that is just a, a complete aberration, this current conflict with Hamas? And the answer is no. Hamas was Israel completely withdrew from the, from the uh, Gaza Strip in 2005. In 2006, there were elections. In 2006, Hamas won. And, and the Palestinian Authority, the PA, was kicked out. In fact, they were actually, most of them were executed. Uh, we have videos. I've seen those videos. I assume that they're still online and you could probably find them if you wanted. So when Hamas won the election, they either expelled or executed the uh, leaders of the PA, Palestinian Authority, once upon a time, PLO, Yasser Arafat, etc. Still tracking? Still good? Okay, and so 2005, Israel leaves. 2006, elections. 2007, Hamas comes to power, and in less than a year, they are in a shooting war with Israel in 2008 and 29. This is the first war with Hamas. The second one came in 2012. The third one came in 2014. See, it only takes a few years to rearm, you know, to smuggle enough arms back in from Iran and from Yemen and places like that. In 2021, the fourth war between Israel and Hamas. And now we're in not the first, not the second, not the third, not even the fourth. We're in the fifth war between Israel and Hamas. This is the reason why you hear the Minister of Defense, Bibi Netanyahu, and others saying, this has to end here. Why is that? Because if Hamas is allowed to continue, and by the way, when they were elected in 2005, they assumed that it was for life. There's never been another election in the Gaza Strip. They rule with iron fist. There are honor killings. There are lips removed for lipstick. Uh, there are forced veils that have to be worn. Um, it, it, is, it is Sharia on steroids in the Gaza Strip under the rule of Hamas. And basically what Israel has awakened and seen is we let them off the hook again, and we're back here in 2025 doing the same thing. I have a question for you guys. Is that what you would want for your children? Is that how you'd want your teenagers to grow up? So this is what Israel is facing, not the first or third or fourth, but the fifth war with this 
offshoot, this offshoot of radical Islam that came from the Muslim Brotherhood. Again, look it up on the internet, please. So my question is, as, as people who live a long way off, and as people who are neither Israeli nor Palestinian, we are ne neither Jewish nor are we Arab, most of us, my question is, what do we do? And I shared some of this at the very end of the message in the first service. We're so far away, and we seem to be so disconnected, but are we? Does anybody remember the bombing that just took place on the American-Canadian border at Niagara Falls? Didn't hear about that. You did hear about that, okay? How about the hundreds of thousands that are pouring in on the southern border? And more than a thousand have been detained who were from Iran and Iraq. Why are they here? And why are they coming through our southern border? Not, I'm not playing politics. I'm talking numbers and realities here. This is not a Republican versus Democrat issue. This is a people issue. Um, why is it that there have been stabbings of Jewish community leaders and synagogue leaders? Why is it that there was an Israeli diplomat who was almost assassinated in China? This is a global conflict, ladies and gentlemen. It's at our doorstep whether we like it or not. So we are involved. So my question is, what do we do? The first thing that we do is we pray. Why do we do that? Because the Bible tells me so. Remember that song? Okay. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And it's not an option. It's not a suggestion. This is a command. Well, I know, but I'm only 15 years old. It, if you name the name of Jesus, if you accept the Bible as your authority, sorry, you just got your marching orders. Pray about this. I mentioned in first service, when we found out that there were 240 plus people that had been taken as uh, kidnapped as, and taken captive back into Gaza, little children, infants, grandparents, senile people, autistic people taken as prisoners of war back into Gaza to be used as, yes, human shields and also um, as bargaining chips. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that if they're using this as capital, they're trading people for peace, that's human trafficking. These people are not free. These people are slaves. So this is slavery and human trafficking. Make no mistake about that. So pray for the peace of Jerusalem. My grandkids, I mentioned, have three that are still living at home, one at college. The three living at home, they all adopted one of these kids that were right at their age to pray for them. I want you to know that God hears prayer. All three of those kids that my three grandkids adopted and prayed for, they're all home. They've all been released. Three for three. You know anybody that bats a thousand or that makes a hundred percent of their free throws? No. Three for three. Pray. Kids, seven, six, seven, eight, nine year olds, will you pray? There are kids your age that are still captive and they're held underground, some of them deprived of food and even light and contact with other human beings. Pray. Another, some kind of way, you find, get creative, get to praying, ask God to, to, to help you find a way to comfort God's people. Even if it's just holding a prayer vigil. And yeah, put it out on social media and let the radio stations know we are standing in support. We are, we are praying and we are wanting to comfort God's people. A final thing is, do whatever you have to do. Yeah, give, contribute. Standwithus.com, um, Wall Builders, Convoy of Hope is there. Find a place, find a way to give. Do whatever you can to rescue the weak and the needy and deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. Would you stand with me and pray and let's commit to do those things? Lord God, we didn't ask for this to be a part of our world or our reality or our lives, but some kind of way it's found its way to our doorstep. As your people, we want to be informed. 
we want to make reasoned and, and logical and evidence-based decisions. And Lord God, we also, as your people, hearing your word, we want to be motivated to action. God, as we drive down the road and we're daydreaming, as we sit in our home and the TV is on, prick our hearts to turn the TV off and to dial in to you in prayer and to cry out for the deliverance of those who are oppressed, those who sit in bondage, those who are held a prisoner. We pray that you set those captives free, but we pray that you engage us. We ask you to help us, remind us, encourage us, challenge us by the work of your spirit to be people of prayer and to engage at that level. And we know because we've already seen the evidence of it that your hand is not short, that it can't save. You're a mighty God, mighty to save. We ask for rescue. We ask for deliverance. Those, that hundred plus people that are, that are still there in bondage, Lord, we pray that you bring every one of them home safe and sound. Wrap your arms around them. Protect them. God, if it was us and it was happening in our country, we sure would be on our knees and we would be praying. Move us to prayer, we pray. Lord, we pray also that you would help us to be advocates. Advocate for right and not for wrong. Advocate for civility and not for barbarity. Move us to be advocates, to, be, to, 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 to move into our uh, schools and into our community and to advocate for what is right. Finally, move us, God, to give. Find somewhere that's a legit place and be wise as serpents, but help us, Lord God, move us to the point where we're willing to give, to donate, to support. All of these things, prayer, advocacy, giving, donations, Lord God, as the people of God, as your people, move us to action, we pray, in the name of your Son, Jesus, and the name of everything that is holy and everything that is right. In Jesus' name, amen.